Welcome to Kids Talk Church History, a one of a kind podcast where kids investigate the history of the church. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Has he kept his promise? How has Jesus built and preserved his church against all odds? Come with us on a trip through history to find the answer here on Kids Talk Church History. Bringing your husband to faith should have been neither slow nor difficult for you, Pope Gregory I wrote to Queen Bertha. During the Middle Ages, many popes and bishops encouraged Christian princesses to marry non-Christian kings to bring them to faith. But was it really as easy as Pope Gregory made it sound? Stay with us to find out. I'm Emma, I'm 15, and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm Trinity, I'm also 15 and live in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm Christian. I'm 13, and I also live in Charleston, South Carolina. Okay, so imagine being a Christian princess and being given in marriage to a pagan king with the commission to convert him. Actually, I can't really imagine how I would have felt. I think in those days, girls grew up expecting that they would one day marry someone they may not like at all. So it was kind of part of their duty. Yeah, it sounds really scary. It sure does. But for Bertha and her daughter, Ethelberga, the story ended up pretty well for them. For others, that was not always the case, though. Yes, we talked a little about Bertha in another episode. Her parents just made sure she could continue to worship freely and send a bishop with her to lead that worship and be her advisor. Then, because of that, her husband, Ethelbert, became a Christian. Yeah, and that was in the episode about Augustine of Canterbury. And what about her daughter? So Ethelberga, or Ethelbert, we assume it was her daughter. She was King Ethelbert's daughter, but Bertha might have died. We don't know much about her. Anyway, so the same thing happened to Ethelberga. She was given in marriage to Edwin, king of Northumbria, with the condition that she could worship freely under the guidance of a bishop, in her case, Paulinus. That means little Paul, right? Yes, you know your Latin. The story of how Edwin became a Christian is actually one of my favorites. At first, Edwin promised that he would become a Christian if God saved him from an enemy. But when God did, Edwin started to worry that his people would not agree with his conversion. I get how that could have been a problem because in those days, nations were supposed to be united in their religion. Yeah, I see how that would be really strange for us to imagine in our times. It's like having a president who turns Muslim and asks the whole country to be Muslim. But back then, people were just used to having the same religion and keeping the same religious holidays. In fact, they judged a religion based on its results. If they prayed to a god for victory over their enemies and they won, they thought that was the true god. Of course, that's not a good test for Christianity because our god is not like a genie from a lamp that's supposed to grant all our wishes. I've read about a Christian queen in France, Clotilda, when her first son died. Um, Almost immediately after being baptized, her husband was quick to tell her that she worshipped a worthless god. She must have felt very terrible. Yeah, she was already heartbroken because her son died, and then the king made it sound like it was her fault for following the wrong god. These women who married pagan kings had to face a lot of oppression. And that's one reason why the Bible tells us not to be yoked to unbelievers. The Israelites in the Old Testament weren't even allowed to marry non-Jews. So why did the Pope encourage these mixed marriages? In the case of Ethelberga, Pope Boniface quoted another verse, the unbelieving husband shall be saved by the believing wife. I've usually heard that in the in that context, that is, if you are already married to an unbeliever. I guess those wives felt like they were missionaries. And they were in a way, but I haven't told you what happened to King Edwin. So he asked his counselors what to do. And one of them gave a very wise answer. I'm going to read it as Bede, a medieval historian, told it. The present life of man, O king, seems to me in comparison to that time which is unknown to us, like the swift flight of a sparrow through the room wherein you sit at supper in winter with your commanders and ministers and a good fire in the midst, whilst storms of rain and snow prevail abroad. The sparrow, I say, flying in one door and immediately out the other, whilst he is within, is safe from the wintry storm. But after a short space of fair weather, he immediately vanishes out of your sight into the dark winter from which he had emerged. So this life of man appears for a short space, but of what went before or what is to follow, we are utterly ignorant. If, therefore, this new doctrine contains something more certain, it seems justly to deserve to be followed. That is a really beautiful quote. I think today we would just say, if you want to do it, just do it. And it's not just based on whether the Christian God gave favors or not. It's based on the fact that only Christianity has true answers about life. Yeah, that's 
So true. I love that quote. But it is getting late and we have a wonderful expert, Dr. Eleanor Parker, who can tell us a lot about this fascinating time in history. Dr. Parker is a lecturer in medieval English literature at Brasno's College in Oxford, has written many books and had a very interesting blog about medieval England. Dr. Parker, thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot of questions for you today. (laughs) Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. So first, can you tell us a little bit about the time in history when Bertha, Ethelberga, and Edwin lived? That was between the 6th and 7th centuries, right? How Mm -hmm. widespread was Christianity in England? Yeah, so this is a period when Christianity is almost completely new to England. Um, So this is what we call the early Anglo-Saxon period, when it's before there even was a place called England. Um, The Anglo-Saxons live in these different kind of kingdoms, different parts of England, the different kingdoms. Um, And the Anglo-Saxons had come to Britain from uh, like Northern Europe, Germany and so on, that kind of area. And when they came to Britain, they were pagans. They had uh, like a whole range of pagan gods that they worshipped. and they didn't know anything about Christianity. They didn't follow Christianity. Um, but Christianity had been spreading across Europe um, and then their neighbours were Christian. So like the area that's now France and uh, Ireland was Christian. So kind of it was, you know, um, <laughs> surrounding them. And uh, there was this kind of effort by the Pope to convert the Anglo-Saxons. So we're talking about the time kind of starting around the very end of the 6th century, about the year 600, just before um, when missionaries start coming from Rome to convert the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and of course it was a very slow process because you've got all these different kingdoms. They don't all convert at once. It's one after another, and then some are more resistant than others. So it's quite a, a kind of complicated process and it takes quite a long time. So it seems like the Christian queens like Bertha and Ethelberga played a major role in bringing Christianity to England. Why do we know so little about them? Well, so one thing is we do know kind of more about them than we do about a lot of people in this period, um, because actually, you know, this is a period when uh, there just aren't that many written sources is the main reason, Um, partly because before they converted to Christianity, the Anglo-Saxons had an oral culture. They didn't write, they hardly wrote anything down. Um, And books and writing came to them only with the coming of Christianity and the missionaries. So before that, everything was passed on by word of mouth. Um, There just wasn't much writing. And so from this early part of the the Anglo-Saxon period, we have very kind of few written sources really. Um, So like you mentioned, Bede is our main source, almost our only source for some of the material that that we're talking about today. And that's just because there aren't many other people writing in this time. I read in your blog that after King Edwin was baptized, many of his people were as well. So that Paulinus was very busy catechizing them. That means it wasn't just a formal a formal conversion, like the king is Christian, so I need to be Christian. It seems that they took it very seriously, at, at least Paulinus did, right? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, Christianity was, was totally new, so they had to sort of start from the basics, um, teach the actual essentials of what do Christians believe, what is in the Bible, you know, who do Christians say that Jesus Christ was, all these kind of really basic stuff. Um, and then, of course, they also wanted to introduce people to the idea of living a Christian life, you know, Christian ethics, following Christian festivals, um, Christian marriage customs, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it was it was new. It had to be taught to them. And then, uh, you know, because, as I was saying, they didn't have, you know, most people weren't, couldn't read or write. It all had to be taught orally. Um, and that kind of makes it quite a long process as well. Um, Another thing I read in your blog that Edwin's kingdom was so peaceful that, quote, a woman with her newborn babe might walk throughout the island from sea to sea without receiving any harm, end quote. That means those centuries were normally violent times, right? And being able to walk freely and safely was an exception. Do you think that they were more violent in those centuries that came after or before I think it definitely was a violent time from our point of view, um, partly because all these different Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were quite often at war with each other. <laughs> so that was one reason it was violent. Um, but kings like Edwin were making an effort to, you know, impose law, to punish wrongdoers, to kind of in- bring peace to their kingdoms. Um, and I think there were more violent periods in even in Anglo-Saxon history, like when the Vikings turned up. I think that was probably even more violent at times. So, yeah, from our point of view, definitely it would seem like a pretty violent period. Okay, so I love architecture. And the quote that I read earlier about the sparrow inspired this next question. So how could a sparrow in winter fly inside a palace through one door and out the other? Did they not close the doors? Was it no doors? Um, Is it just a poetic image? How does how does that work? That is such a good question. Um, I, partly it is a poetic image, that is definitely part of it. But also I think, so when we're thinking about like where a king might live in the Anglo-Saxon period, it's not what we would consider a palace, it's just like a big wooden hall. Um, and it would be decorated with kind of wooden carvings and maybe tapestries and hangings and things like that. Um, 
but they would sort of just have this one big space where they would do everything, eat and, you know, meet together and everything. Um, and they would have to have openings because you'd have an open fire in the hall and you'd have to let smoke out. So there would be kind of, you know, the wind getting in and maybe birds getting in as well. So, yeah, that might be why. So Edwin was baptized in 627 and died in battle in 633. What happened to Ethelberga after that? Yes. Yeah, so after Edwin was killed, um, Ethelberga went back to Kent because her so her parents were dead by this point, but her brother was now king of Kent um, and he kind of protected her. Um, and she actually settled down in a, a little place in Kent called Liminge. Um, and she seems to have founded like a kind of monastery there. Um, and there's been some really interesting archaeological excavations in Liminge and just in the past couple of years, which have found actually the hall that Ethelberga might have lived in and the monastery um, and some of the stuff, you know, like jewelry and things um, that she might have had at that time. So um, she kind of found a new home for herself down in Kent. So that sounds like a delightful way to end your life. I mean, (laughs) other than your husband dying, of course. But um, it seems in general that these queens had pretty rough lives, quite different from the, the royal image we get in Disney movies. So did they leave any writings, these queens, um, that we can read for encouragement or just just anything that they left with their own words? Um, no, sadly not. Um, we, we only really know about them kind of at second hand. Um, and again, that's kind of like not that unusual for medieval people because so many people didn't read or write. Um, yeah, you're right. They didn't live very easy lives, definitely. The, you know, it wasn't an easy time to be a royal woman. <laughs> On your blog, I also saw pictures of statues depicting Ethelbert greeting Bertha after a battle. I know that these statues were made much later, but they portray Ethelbert and Bertha as if they were happy to see each other. Do you think Bertha and Ethelberga might have had happy marriages after all? Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. I mean, obviously, they they didn't have a lot of choice in who they married, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't a happy marriage. Um, I think definitely uh, Ethelbert, we have a sense that he did have a lot of respect for his wife because he did allow her to go on practicing her faith after their marriage, even when he was still a pagan, he kind of gave her space in his city in Canterbury where she could worship. He allowed her to have, you know, a priest with her. Um, So he clearly kind of respected her religion um, and was willing to kind of, you know, eventually adopt it himself. So I think you can kind of see a a relationship of maybe mutual respect and and maybe affection as well. It'd be nice to think so, wouldn't it? (laughs) I have some questions too. I've seen in your blog many writings in Old English. Can you read us something to us in that language, maybe the beginning of John 1? Sure. Okay, so I will read uh, the first few verses of the Gospel of John in Old English. Um, So this is, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and so on. So on Frumtha was word and that word was Midgolder and gold was that word. That was on Frum and Midgolder. Er a thing wherein you wachter through hine and nan thing nas you wacht booten him. That was leaf they on him you worked was, and that leaf was mana leocht, and that leocht licht on thustrum, and thustru that ye ne yanamun. The light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. That sounds very beautiful, and I had another question. Did Edwin and Ethelberga have a son who later became king? No, so they did have a son, but their son died when he was still quite young. Um, they did have a daughter who uh, lived to adulthood, her name was Ainflaid, um, and she went back to Northumbria and she became a queen as well, like her mother. Um, and then after the end of her marriage, she also went to, to a religious community um, at Whitby Abbey in Yorkshire. So she had quite a similar life to her mother, in fact. So we have talked about Bertha and Ethelberga, but there were many other medieval queens like them. Do you have a favourite? <laughs> yeah, there are quite a lot of them. Um, it's kind of interesting because actually in this first uh, period, you know, the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity, um, medieval queens seem to have been much more keen on adopting Christianity than the kings. Kings like Edwin were a bit more sceptical. Um, so there's quite a lot of interesting medieval women from this period. Um, I My favourite is probably a woman called uh, Ethel Drada, um, or sometimes called Audrey or Ethel Frith. Um, and she was from East Anglia. She was based at, at Ely. Um, and she's from the kind of generation after Ethelberga. Um, she was also uh, married to, to a king, actually twice. <laughs> she was married to, to different kings. Um, but then what she really wanted was to be a nun and an abbess. So she founded a monastery at Ely. Um, and it was that's an interesting one because she led it with her sisters and then her sister's daughters after them and their granddaughters after them. So it's a kind of 
dynasty of um, of women at Ely there. Um, and Ely has a, a absolutely beautiful medieval cathedral. So that's one reason that I really like, <laughs> like the story of Ely. And I was wondering, since there have been so many like Ethel Burger names and the other name that you're saying, is there any meaning to that name? Yeah, um, and it makes a lot of sense. So Ethel means noble in Old English. So like, obviously, you'd call kings and queens Ethel. <laughs> okay. So, so thank you so much for these answers. I'm learning a lot. At this point, we have a couple of questions we ask our guests. First, how did you become interested in church history and what do you do in your free time? <laughs> um, so my background is in literature more than in history. So originally I was studying uh, English literature. And when I came to university, I started studying uh, medieval literature. So Anglo-Saxon literature, but also things like Chaucer and, and later medieval stuff. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with it. So that's what I do now. That's what I teach. That's what I write about. Um, and then so to understand the literature, you really need to know about the, the church history as well, because they're just so closely related uh, in the medieval period. So the two things kind of really go together. Um, and as for what I do in my free time. Uh, so I live in a, a really uh, I live in Oxfordshire in a really kind of beautiful um countryside area near the River Thames. Um, so most of what I do in my free time is kind of wander by the river and, and explore the countryside and, and that kind of thing. So. Dr. Parker, we are so thankful that you decided to spend this time with us and share your knowledge. It's always a pleasure to learn from you. But we'll say goodbye for now. Before we go, we want to, to just remind our listeners, if you have a question or comment, you can email it to questions at kidstalkchurchhistory.org and enter to win a copy of Simonetta Carr's most recent book, Church History, which was named Best Children's Nonfiction by World Magazine. And on our website, you will also find past episodes, special offers, news, recommended readings, and more. And don't forget to tell your friends where they can find us. In partnership with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals and on behalf of my co-hosts, Trinity and Christian, I'm Emma. Thank you for listening to Kids Talk Church History.